Thank you for joining us today. If you're joining our ACC community for the very first time, we want to extend a very warm welcome to you today. And we would invite you to visit our website at alliancecommunity.ca to just learn a little bit more about who we are and also to connect with us. So visit the I'm New tab on our website. Click on there, there's a connect card there. We'd love for you to fill that out so that we can get in touch with you and just really connect with you in a new way. If you're one of our regular attenders with ACC, we also want to extend a very warm welcome to you. We want to thank you. Um, you are a very vital member of our family and we're so very thankful for your generosity, for your involvement, um, and we're just so thankful to have you as part of our family. Speaking of family, I have a few family matters that I want to bring to your attention today. The first is we um, are blessed to have an upcoming baptism service here at the church on Sunday, August 29th at 6 p.m. here at ACC. If you would like to be baptized, we would love to hear from you. So please contact Pastor Jim. You can email him at jim at alliancecommunitychurch.ca or you can call the church office and connect with him here. Secondly, we are super excited to tell you that we are kicking off our fall ministries. Um, we're having our big kickoff on Sunday, September 12th. We're calling it Take the Dip because we want to give you the opportunity to dive in to different opportunities here in the church. We're, you're going to have opportunity to see and hear from different small groups that are running, um, ministries that are operating. We just want you to dive in and get involved in our community here at ACC. This will be a fun day. You will have an opportunity to hear from the heart of the leadership, as well as there will be some fun activities and some great food. So we're very excited for you to join us for that day. So mark that down. Now that is also the Sunday that we are kicking off kids ministry. Yes, yes, we are kicking off kids ministry. I know you are as excited as I am. We are super thrilled to be able to launch our kids ministry once again and so we need for you as our families to please pre-register your kids before that date so you can do that in a couple of ways one you can come by the church we've got registration forms here you can fill them out or you can visit our website on alliancecommunity.ca kids you will see the registration form there now in order to run effective ministries for our kids and to be able to disciple them in their walk with Jesus, we need you. We need people who love Jesus to share that love with our kids. And so also we need many volunteers. Now there's so many different ways that you can volunteer. You can be anything from providing snack for kids on our after school ministry programs to cuddling babies, to being part of our welcome team and helping families sign in on a Sunday morning, to teaching kids in Sunday school, to reading Bible stories to kids, to just spending time with them and mentoring them. We need so many hands in order to be effective ministers for Jesus to these little ones. And so I would ask that you pray about how you can be a part of God's ministry here at ACC and then contact me. There's a few ways you can do that. One, you can email me at christy at alliancecommunitychurch.ca. You can come into the church. I'd love to talk to you firsthand. Um, as well as you can also visit our alliancecommunity.ca slash kids page, and there is actually a volunteer form on there that you can fill out, and then I will contact you, and we'll arrange a time to meet and hear your heart of how you'd like to be involved with kids ministry. So please, please join us. Well, as we enter into a time of praise and worship this morning, I wanted to read from Isaiah 12, verses 4 to 6. And this is what it says. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. And proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known in all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Let us pray. Lord, we proclaim your greatness and all the glorious things you have done. Thank you for giving us the gift of your Son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for laying down your life so that we may have life. May the words from our mouths be filled with adoration and thanksgiving for all you have done and are doing in our lives. May your name be lifted high 
and may you be glorified in Jesus' name, amen. Sing for the breath that you've given Every day for the life you sustain The beat of the heart before when I was made Let me worship your wonder and splendor Through the heavens your glory proclaim They don't know the price you pay for the life Sacrifice you made
Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are and that you are always at work. Jesus, I pray for those among us who may be struggling with illness, who may have lost loved ones. Father, I, I pray that, that you as the mighty healer would heal their bodies and restore them to health. That Jesus, you as the comforter, would be the comforter that you are, and that you would be pre bring peace and comfort to those that have lost loved ones. Lord, I pray for our community, and we have such a great opportunity to be light here in Sylvan Lake. So Jesus, I pray that we would be your hands and your feet, that we would go and be a light into a lost world, that your name would be lifted high, that you would be glorified. Holy Spirit, I pray that as Tim comes now to share from your word, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would draw us closer to you, that we would hear from you, 
and our lives will be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey everybody, good to be with you today. My name is Tim, one of the pastors here, and uh, I'm looking forward to opening God's Word to us today. While it was a hot afternoon in the Judean countryside, a lone man stood atop a barren hillside and surveyed the scene before him. His name was Judas Maccabeus. He was the son of a priest from the village of Modean, and he himself was a priest, but he was more than a priest. He was a fighter. Uh, at the back, at his back, were hundreds of zealous Jews, mercenaries uh, for hire, and soldiers, tough men ready for tough times. They were more than willing to follow Judas. He was a brilliant strategist and warrior. He earned the name Maccabeus, which means hammer, because of the way he hammered his enemies whenever they fought, and they had been fighting for months. Not too long before, the Greeks had come and desecrated the temple in Jerusalem by stripping it of all its religious artifacts and um, uh, e erecting an, ar uh, an idol to the god Zeus. It caused riots in Jerusalem, but they were quickly quelled by the Greeks. A commander of the Greeks came to Judas's village and tried to force Judas's father to sacrifice a pig on the, t on the altar in their tabernacle. This was too much. This broke the camels. This was the straw that broke the camels back. And Judas' father killed the Greek commander and then fled into the hills. But for Judas, hiding wasn't an option. He wanted to free the Jews from all the Greek oppression. And so he began to fight back by means of surprise attacks and ambush he, and quick mobility of his forces. Judas was successful in defeating a succession of Syrian commanders. He was almost always outnumbered, sometimes twice as many. One time, he one time he defeated an army that was six times the size of his force. Sometimes their enemies had elephants. It was overwhelming. The, the, the odds against them winning were high. But his passion for the freedom of the Jews was even higher. Every time they defeated a Syrian force, they captured their weapons and grew in confidence as well as an armory. Judas grew in stature among the, the Jews. They trusted him. They believed in him. He was forcefully and violently taking back their rights from their oppressors, and they were experiencing great success. After many battles won, Judas was finally able to uh, re redeem and restore the temple in Jerusalem. He purified it. They lit a lamp. That lamp was supposed to last and stay lit for one night, but miraculously, it stayed lit for 14 nights. The Jews made a new altar in the temple, and they enacted an eight-day celebration. Surely Judas was the Messiah, many thought. Uh, he was setting Israel free. He was zealous for the things of God, and he was proving himself more powerful than his enemies. He was like the judges of old, like Gideon and Samson and Ehud. He was like King David, the, the powerful uh, warrior and the man after God's own heart. The savior, uh, savior of Israel had come. On this day, though, in 161 BC, with his army of 3,000, Judas was going against an army that was the greatest foe he had faced yet. The Greeks were still committed to defeating the Jews. And uh, they had a guy named Demetrius, a new general, who came to lead the Greeks against the Jews. And he had 24,000 men with him, eight times Judas's force. That wasn't going to stop Judas. They had so much confidence from before. So they came down to attack Demetrius' forces. And there was a battle in the open plains. And uh, the Jews were defeated. Many were killed. Many fled. And Judas was left with 800 men. And that, on that day, on that field, Judas Maccabeus was killed. The Savior had died. He was no more. And every year after that, the Jews celebrated the cleansing of the temple with an eight-day feast called the Feast of Dedication or the Feast of Hanukkah. 
and um, it occurred in the winter months. It was a powerful time of Jewish nationalism and zeal for the Jewish way of life. Well, within a couple hundred years, the Romans took the place of the Greeks as the, as the cruel overlords. Now, they allowed the Jews to continue with their religious festivals, even if they didn't like it. And likely, there were always a few zealous Jews who, during this uh, Feast of Hanukkah, a uh, feast of dedication would want to stand up against the Roman oppressors, to take up arms, to physically fight like Judas Maccabeus did. If you were a Roman in those days, I'm sure you would have been especially on your guard during the feast of dedication. The days and weeks leading up to the feast would have been increased uh, tension and unrest. And in those days, it's in those days leading up to that feast of Hanukkah, the feast of dedication, that we find ourselves in our text today. I just wanted to give you that idea so you could feel what the Israelites were feeling when we go into this text today. See, Jesus, being born and raised a Jew, would have celebrated over 30 Hanukkah feasts. He would have known what the people were thinking and feeling. They had hoped that Judas Maccabeus was the promised Messiah and had been disappointed again. Now, Judas wasn't the first one to claim to be the Messiah, and he wasn't the last. Many would come and go and do that same thing. And now, almost 200 years later, Jesus was making the same claim. It was Jesus' time at bat. What would he do with his moment? What would make him so different than all the other messiahs? He had already performed miracles, driven out demons, and confounded the Pharisees, and taught with extraordinary wisdom and insight. People were taking notice of him. Like in the past, they were building expectations of who uh, and what Jesus would be. As king of the Jews, would he finally set them free from their oppressors? Would he defeat Rome? Would he reestablish them to the glory they once knew under the kingdom of David and Solomon? Would God's chosen people finally have their preeminent place on the earth? The hopes were high for this Messiah. And Jesus knew it. Uh, he didn't have to be a mind reader to understand what his fellow Jews were thinking. And he wasn't going to keep them guessing. He made it very clear who he was and what he was about. So as we look at our, uh, another one of Jesus' I am statements, let's turn in our Bibles to John 10, verses 11 to 18. John 10, 11 to 18. It says this. I am the good shepherd. This is Jesus talking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd. It does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming... He abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Now, this is a very beautiful passage of scripture. I'm sure that's been a great comfort to you. And maybe you're hearing it for the first time. And as you listen to it, you go, oh, this is beautiful. This kind shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. So I did a Google image search for Jesus is the good shepherd. There were many pictures to choose from. I chose a selection of them that kind of represent uh, all the pictures that were there. And I put together a little video. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, we're going to play that video. And I want you to watch it. And then as you're watching it, I want you to think, uh, of an adjective or two that you would use to describe Jesus as the good shepherd. So uh, let's watch that video now and then we'll come back in just a moment.
All right, what kind of adjectives did you come up with? Kind, gentle, uh, maybe write them in the comment box if you are watching online right now. Uh, what kind of words describe Jesus as the good shepherd? Well, those seem like very sane and natural reactions. And you'd think, because we're, we would think the Jews would be sane and natural people too, that, that they would respond the same way. But actually, they respond very, very differently. We talked about this last week, but I'm going to talk about it again because those two passages are together. And this is what it says. Right after Jesus says this about him being the good shepherd, it says this. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? Okay, that is a shocking response. Don't you think? to that passage I just read? Why would they respond that way? Demon-possessed? Raving mad? Stop listening to him? What's going on here? Well, Jesus makes several statements that to the Pharisees and most of the listeners would have been radically controversial and inflammatory. Before we get into them, let's just look at that main statement first. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. You've got to understand that the Jews knew their Bibles like sports fans know their teams, like uh, music lovers know their favorite band names and songs, like a gardener knows all the characteristics of all the plants they put in their garden. So when Jesus uses the term the good shepherd, the minds of his listeners are drawn immediately to the Psalms and the prophets. Let me read a few of the passages that they would likely have thought about when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Psalm 80 verse 1 says, Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. Hmm. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And Psalm 40, verses 10 to 11 says, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young each one of these passages is talking about the Almighty God, the one true God that the Jewish people worshipped. There was no one like him. He stood above all other gods. The others were wisps of smoke compared to the blazing glory that was his. When Jesus called himself the Good Shepherd, he wasn't saying that he was just you know, really talented to take care of sheep. He didn't say that he was a Good Shepherd. He said he was the good shepherd. And he said it twice, just in case anyone missed it. He was saying that when the Psalms and the prophets talked about uh, the sovereign Lord, the one true God, they were talking about him. Now, this would have been explosively blasphemous to a lot of the Jewish listeners, especially the Pharisees. How could a mere man claim to be God? This is no small deal. This is no mild self-revelation. This was worthy of death, and Jesus knew it, but he stated it emphatically all the same. And then while they were still trying to catch their collective religious breath, he hits them with three more statements that were almost as difficult for them to grasp. First thing he says was, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, not everyone was offended by what Jesus said as the Pharisees were. I mean, the scripture said, but others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? There were some who had tinges of hope that maybe this was the Messiah, that Jesus was who he said he was. He was going to come and save Israel. For some of them, their thoughts would have quickly gone to Judas Maccabeus. Remember that this was the feast just before Hanukkah. It would be like if someone on December 20th said, hey, I'm bringing gifts to good little boys and girls, you would immediately think of Santa, right? 
And so when, when uh, Jesus comes and starts talking about being a Messiah and a Savior and a good shepherd, people would have immediately been reminded of Judas Maccabeus because this was right leading into the Feast of Hanukkah. Jesus was so showing um, that this was who he was. And some of those listeners would have hit their fists in their palms and then smiled gleefully at the demise, the coming demise of the Romans. Jesus was showing that he was something special by the miracles he was performing and by the incredible way he taught. Maybe his claim of rescuer was true. And in the midst of their war-mongering thinking, Jesus says, I lay down my life for my sheep. What? What kind of method is that? What do you mean you lay down your life? Don't you mean you, you lay down the lives of the Romans? You kill the Romans? How in the world would it do any good if you just lay down your life? This is such weak action. How can you be a deliverer and talk such cowardly talk? This would have been incredibly difficult for some of them to handle, to get their head around. And Jesus says it five times, five times, so that even the thickest of the bunch could hear what he was saying. He was adamant that the way to his ultimate victory was to sacrifice himself for his sheep. This was a hard pill to swallow. Now, the second statement was as outrageous as the first. He says, I have other sheep, and there shall be one flock. Okay, that was going way too far. The Jews knew that there was only one flock that the shepherd would take care of, and that was the people of Israel. Here's what it says, uh, what the prophet Habakkuk wrote. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people and to save your anointed one. See, there are all the nations of the earth. And then among those nations, there was one nation, one special nation, one unique nation that was set apart, and that was the Jews. They were the anointed one. The great sovereign God came to rescue them. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. He was telling them that he, as God, the good shepherd, was going to gather in all the nations and include them in his flock. Ephesians says this, For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. He was going to make one flock out of the many. He was going to find those who were not currently in his sheep pen and welcome them in. He was going to welcome outsiders. And that would include Romans. Romans. That was unacceptable. Judas Maccabeus wouldn't include Romans. He would kill Romans. Romans were the enemies, and the enemies of the Jews needed to be repelled forcefully. This is how you deal with people who disagree with you, who persecute you, who make things difficult for you. You fight them. Jesus, on the other hand, wanted to welcome them. Jesus wasn't making it easy at all to accept him. His method was ludicrous. Lay down your life. His sphere of acceptability was ridiculous. Gentiles welcomed into God's sheep pen? Still, Jesus isn't done. He's got one more thing to say. He closes his teaching by saying, I have the authority to raise myself from the dead. Okay. Have you ever had a dead car battery? You know that sickening feeling when you turn the key and there's nothing? And you're just, you're at, the, you're at the total mercy of some kind stranger to drive up and pop their hood and use their good battery to infuse life into your dead battery, to jump your dead battery. Now, Jesus was doing some of that already. Uh, he had turned dead eyes into seeing eyes. He had turned dead leprous flesh into clean uh, uh, clean, healthy flesh. He'd even raised several dead people back to life. He was the outside source giving life to the dead. Here, though, Jesus says something very, very different, even greater. He said that he will die, and then, while dead, he will raise himself up to life again. It's impossible. It's impossible as 
as impossible as using a dead car battery to charge itself back to life. But he was going to do it. Well, this was crazy talk. That was such a shocking claim that it was almost laughable. It sounded like the ravings of a madman. But Jesus was totally sane. He said his words with clear and firm conviction. He wasn't crazy. He was confirming that he was God. Only God could accomplish such a feat. See, the Jews knew that no man had final say, authority, over their own life and death. That belonged to God and God alone. Jesus said he had that authority. He said no one took his life from him. He laid it down of his own accord and he will raise it up again. And he said that his authority to do this God deed came from the Father. Jesus was more committed to telling the truth than he was to making friends. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, it was absolutely true that all the things that we think about of when we think of the Good Shepherd, they are true. Our first impressions of Jesus are not wrong. Some of those adjectives that you came with up at the beginning, kind, strong, brave, wise, gentle. It's right for us to think of Jesus that way, but we can miss all that Jesus is saying because we're focused on those points alone. We live in a me-focused society, and we're a me-focused generation. We like the things that Jesus does for us. Why wouldn't we? We're always looking for what's best for us, but the relationship with Jesus is a two-way street. Jesus is also saying that he is God. Jesus is not a convenience. He's not someone that you have associations with and check in with occasionally when you feel like you have need of him. He's not a genie in a lamp that just you rub the lamp and he comes out whenever you want and grants you wishes. He's God. That means that he has ultimate authority in our lives. As a Christ follower, you have surrendered your right to decide how you will live your life. You will live it the way he says to live it. That means your views on sexual purity must be his views on sexual purity. Your thoughts on submission to authority must be his thoughts on submission to authority. Your actions toward the poor and the outcast must be his actions toward the poor and the outcast. If you want to be boss of your own life, you can. Just don't call yourself a Christ follower. Jesus didn't leave that option open to us. So then our mission must be to see how Jesus responded to things and do what he did. In our passage today, Jesus shows the way to deal with those we have problems with. Those that offend us or those that step on our rights. He laid down his life. Hmm. Elsewhere it says this, you've heard that it was said eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. Someone wants to sue you and take your cloak, give him your coat as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks from you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you, that you might be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. Paul echoes this thoughts in Romans 12 when he writes, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. This is not easy teaching. Will you be willing to lay down your life or will you fight back? Will you be like Jesus or Judas Maccabeus? Who will be your shepherd? And in our passage, Jesus said that as a good shepherd, he would welcome all kinds of people into a sheep pen. Are we ready and willing to associate with the sheep that Jesus embraces? Will you accept those who've had a dark and dirty past? Will you love those with different political 
or sexual views? Will you warmly receive those who feel strongly and differently about whether, differently than you, about whether to get vaccinated or not, about whether to open up the province or not, or whether to wear masks or not? Will you be one with those who struggle with addiction? Will we look like and follow our good shepherd, or will we do it our own way, our natural way? I'm so grateful that Jesus is my good shepherd. I've received incredible blessings uh, because of that. But I must take all of him or none of him. He will not allow himself to be partitioned off. He will not allow himself to be compartmentalized. Either he is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. Now, Jesus is the standard by which we measure everything. And as we stand before him, we are reminded again that he is our good shepherd. On the one hand, we will find peace and comfort in him. Listen to the beautiful words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is good that Jesus is our good shepherd. We're reminded of these glorious truths and they bring joy and hope to our lives. On the other hand, though, we are challenged by his claim to be Lord of everything in our lives. He is the shepherd, the good shepherd. His sheep go where he leads them. His method, his way was one of sacrifice. And his affection and scope of acceptance included many who we might find uncomfortable to associate with. As our good shepherd, will we trust him? Will he be our good shepherd today? Well, we, whenever we come to the end of our teaching time, we have time of listening prayer. And that's what we want to go, do again right now. So wherever you are, if you're driving your car, uh, if you're sitting at home, uh, we're going to take some time of quiet just to listen. I'm going to create that space for you. And uh, take advantage of it. Jesus is with you right now. He's a good shepherd. He knows where you are. He's, a, he's attentive to you. He's aware of you. And he wants to speak to your heart. So listen to him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can come and uh, be in your presence. Thank you that you hear us, that you love us, that you know us. And thank you that you haven't um, pulled back on any truth about who you are. You are the shepherd. And the sheep uh, that follow you and listen to your voice are your sheep. Help us to be your sheep. In this moment, shepherd, we listen to you. Speak to us. Maybe Jesus is pointing out an area right now in your life that you haven't surrendered to him. An area where you are fighting back, you're rebelling against him. And he's, he's uh, asking you to surrender that to him right now. Maybe there's an area in your life where you've wanted to fight back. Someone has stepped on your toes, on your rights. You just want to fight. And Jesus is asking you to lay down your life. Maybe there's someone who you'd rather not see in the sheep pen. You feel like they don't deserve the love of Jesus. 
They don't deserve to experience what you experience. Is Jesus pointing someone out to you right now? Maybe you don't know that you're in the sheep pen of God. You don't know Jesus as your good shepherd. He's calling you right now. He's inviting you. Will you respond to him? Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for what you teach us, how you want us to align with you. Because you've come that we might have life to the full. Thank you that you've laid down your life for us. That you don't run when danger comes, you stay. You're not the hired hand, you're the shepherd. And so we, um, we give you thanks today. Give us the grace and the strength to live lives worthy of the calling that you've given us. Live lives of obedience to follow you, chief shepherd, good shepherd. Follow you with our whole hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, all for Jesus. All I am and have ever hoped to be Jesus Don't for Jesus All I am and have ever hoped to be All of my ambitions, hopes, and plans, and I surrender these into your hands. And all of my ambitions, hopes, and plans, and I Surrender these to your hands for it's only in your wisdom that I am free for it's only in your will that I am
Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, I trust this has been encouraging and challenging to your heart. If you'd like to talk to me about it, please send me a note. Uh, give me a call at the church. I'd love to be able to talk with you more about this. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would love to talk with you about that as well. Uh, I love what it says in Psalm 100. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever, his faithfulness through all generations. Friends, you are deeply loved by the good shepherd. He really cares about you. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to uh, live the way he wants you to live, that he's asking you to live. Because in that there's life and life to the full. Because his love uh, is, he, because the Lord is good and his love endures forever. So live in that truth today and this week, friends. God be with you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.